So this morning, um, there's something specific I want to share with you. But before I do, I, I do have a couple of questions for you. Uh, would you raise your hand if you were here during the week devoted to God, Tuesday night when I was speaking? It, when I was speaking, not, not any other night? Okay, quite a lot of you. Okay, thank you. Would you raise your hand if you actually remember what I was uh, saying? <laughs> okay, at least, at least you're honest. A couple people. Okay, so if you do remember, uh, I actually want to talk to you first. Uh, don't tune me out, okay? Because, you know, when, uh, um, when uh, somebody starts sharing something and it's like, oh, yeah, I heard this one before, and then you can just go turn off the lights. Don't do that, because what we did on that Tuesday night was actually more about ministry, but the Lord really spoke to something specific to me, and, and I felt like I was supposed to preach on that specifically, so it will be, it will be different. I put some new jokes in there, so don't worry, it will be different. <laughs> okay, I, I have one more question for you, and now this is related to my message, really. Um, I was wondering, out of curiosity, um, I just wanted to do this, like, head ca or kind of just an inventory, like, how long have you guys been in this church, okay? Like, if you're watching on live stream, you can feel free to write it in the chat, but I'm going to, for those of you guys who are here, I'm going to ask you a question and just raise your hand, okay? If, if you've been in this church for, uh, for uh, less than six months, how about that? Ra would you raise your hand just so I can okay, know? Thank you. Okay, if you've been in this church like a year, a year or less, would you raise your hand? Okay, a few of you. Okay, if you've been here, let's say three years, okay, would you raise your hands? Three years or under? Awesome. What about uh, six years? Let's do that, six years. Awesome. All right, 10 years, 10 years, okay, very good. 20 years or under, between 10 and 20, a few of you, okay, over, over 20 years, raise your hand, wow, okay, that's great. Yeah, why don't you give those guys a big round of applause. That's, that's, the, that's the compliment. Now, here's the wet blanket. If... The longer you have been here at this church, uh, I will argue with you that the more difficult this will be for you to listen to or, or receive. Uh, the, the less time you have been here, uh, the easier it will be. And the reason I say that, because the topic that's really on my heart is, uh, I, I guess I titled my sermon is Adapt, Adapting to Change. Adapting to Change, Okay. Um, you know, I, I always, I always thank God for, for, um, for a church and, and ministers like, like ours and, and especially Pastor John and his heart that, you know, all, I understand, I mean, I'm on church staff, so trust me, I do understand that there's a structure of church and the way we do things, um, and there's a reason why, why we do things specifically at church, um, but we always want to be aware and careful that it doesn't become a program. Amen? So I'm, I'm just thankful for ministers who, who, you know, who get up here and they really just try to listen to the Holy Spirit as they speak, before they speak, but even during and while they are speaking and after they're done speaking. Amen? Uh, because if you know anything about, I would say, the characteristics of the Holy Spirit... I think one of the things sometimes he does is he likes to change things. Uh, he doesn't always do the same thing again and again. Amen? You know, I can prove that to you with Scripture very easily. Look at Jesus' ministry. How many times did Jesus perform the same miracle the same exact way? Probably, you know, how many times you see him make mud, rub it into someone's eye, and open their eyes? I think you only see it once in Scripture, right? And we know... That Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit, and He says, "I do nothing except what my I hear my Father is doing." Uh, and you see it on His ministry that He was in tune with the Holy Spirit, and things didn't really look the same a whole lot. Amen. So the word that I have for you really is is this: you know, change is coming to this church. And let me just like state the obvious here. 
if you have been involved with this church, you probably heard about the highway uh, overpass that they're going to build. And that's a significant change. I mean, how, many, how often do you move a church? Uh, usually not very often, right? Uh, so there's, there's change in the physical that is, that is coming to this church. And if you're struggling with that, hopefully actually this will help, help you. This, that's, hopefully this message will encourage you. But change is coming. And, and you know, I was <laughs> thinking about this. I think there is like a stigma or, or a stereotype that, you know, for us young people, it's like, oh, we're all about change and we love change. We actually had a leaders meeting uh, about the highway overpass not that long ago. And, and Pastor Karen, I don't think she's here uh, to, uh, to defend herself, but she accused, she accused me um, that... <laughs> That when, when we remodel this church, how many of you even remember, raise your hand, how before the remodel was done, the stage was a lot different. It was about this high, it was further back. And, and anyways, she, she, she had this picture, I, little did I know, but here I was with a sledgehammer. Uh, Bob, I think you were here too. And we were taking this stage, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not very good at building, but I'm, I'm pretty good at terminating things. <laughs> And so I'm, I'm terminating the stage, right? And, and Pastor Karen was back there, and I didn't notice. And, 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 and I think tears are rolling down her eyes because what she's thinking of, like, oh, the kids' ministry that she did in this church on this stage and the puppet shows and all that. And here's Peter, you know, the young Peter who just doesn't care. And uh, he's just like, he just says, oh, we got to change things up. We got to tear things out. And and I will just say this, that, you know, I, believe it or not, I don't like change. Well, one, I'm actually not that young, okay? Like, <laughs> I, I, I'm over 30 now, and I, I notice things in my body where, like, <laughs> like I, I didn't notice before, but I can just sleep the wrong side on the pillow, and then my back be in pain for, like, five days afterwards. It's like, I don't know what happened. So, but... For all of you who think that the younger generation, they're just all about change, I will argue with you that, that change, nobody likes change. That it's, it's in our human nature that we just don't like change. You know, I, I'll, I'm specifically, I hate change. I'm a planner. I like when things are going according to the plan. But change is, is necessary oftentimes. Amen? So... Again, let me just go back. Change is coming to this church. And when I say that, change is coming in the natural. That's obvious. But did you know that change is coming in the spiritual, in, in the way we operate in ministry? And actually, if you noticed, change has already been happening. I'll give you one really simple example. I'll make a segue here. But I noticed, like, actually it was this week, and I realized we're missing a bunch of people. Like, I was starting doing inventory, like the Logans, the Johnsons, the Moes, the, you know, the Pennings. I mean, the list can go on. Like, these people who I, like, I dearly love and I got used to being here at church with us, they're just, they're not here. Why? Because we, we have a vision to plant churches in the River Valley, and we're sending people out. And, and, uh, I don't like that, you know. I am kind of like, I'm actually like Peter, the Apostle Peter at the Mount of Transfiguration, where, where it says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. I'll build a tent for you. Uh, who was there? El Moses and Elijah. And it's good for us to be here. And, and many times I feel the same way. And the message in the church is the same, where come here. This is, this is a good place. This is, this is good. Come over here. And yet, the Bible clearly says, go, not come, but it says go, go out and minister. It, this perfectly leads into my segue. Uh, Jim and Linda Hoffman, would you guys come up here? Sorry, I didn't tell you this, that this was happening. <laughs> but Jim and Linda Hoffman are, are yeah, <laughs> it's okay, we'll pray for you. Yeah. They, they have been our lead elders for many years. Six or seven years at this church. And this is actually their last Sunday 
at this church, believe it or not. And they're not getting raptured, they're not getting raptured <laughs> but they got offended and they're leaving. <laughs> so I'm calling them out right now. Anyway, that's a joke. The reason, the reason it is their last Sunday is because they feel led to go up uh, to Outpost Church, uh, a little north of here, and help Nathaniel and the Johnsons uh, with the church plan. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that. I just want to pray for them real quick, if you would reach out your uh, arms and pray with me. Father God, we just thank you for everything that the Hoffmans have sowed into this church, Lord, all the time, energy, money, finances, Lord. I just pray that you will return that back to their lives a hundredfold. Lord, and I just pray that they are blessed as they're coming in and as they're going out. Lord, thank you that uh, they hear your voice and, and they are ready uh, to go and minister the gospel. And Lord, as they go up there, Lord, I just pray for anointing over their ministry and anointing and, and the power of the Holy Spirit to reach all the lives up there that they're supposed to reach in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you guys give them a big round of applause? Thank you, guys. So, again, things are different. You know, things are changing. Amen? So, this is what I want to encourage you with this morning. I wrote down three self-reflecting uh, questions that you can ask yourself uh, that's related to change. And, and the first one is, why are you so afraid of change? Why are you so afraid of change? Why? And again, I'm preaching to the choir. I, I really am. I'm preaching to myself, actually, because... I know I, I don't like change. Has anyone ever heard of the book, Who Moved My Cheese? Yeah. You raised your hand. You, you guys, wow, a lot of you. It's, a, it's not one of those deep theological, you know, Christian uh, books that you hear referencing at church. Uh, I know the Shackleys have because they, they, they recommended it to me. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to spoil the book for you because, well, I, I will spoil the book in a sense of I will tell you what it's about, but that's, it's not, it's not going to spoil it in a sense that you're supposed to read it. If you're struggling with change, you should read that book. It's, it's, what it is, it's, it's a cautionary tale about the dangers of complacency and the importance of embracing change. Change represents the unknown that simply challenges our sense of safety and security. So in other words, uh, see, the book is about seeing change, adapting to change, and embracing change, okay? And why it's called Who Moved My Cheese? Because it's a short book. Uh, it's about a maze uh, with four little characters. Two are two little mice and two are two little human beings. And in this maze that represents life, there's cheese somewhere. And they all find it, all four of them, and they keep going there uh, to feed on it. That's their supply. Now, the cheese is the metaphor in your life of things that you're seeking, right? And that's why I'm not spoiling the book for you because depending on what you're seeking right now, you know, let's say you lost your job and you need a new job, it's a good book for you. But I will argue with you that, you know, as Christians and believers, you know, we know that we're supposed to seek the kingdom of God first. Uh, so again, you can fill in the blank for cheese, whatever you want to fill in the blank from your life, a relationship, uh, whatever it is. And it's about these four characters that are finding the cheese, and they, and they feed on it, and then it's gone one day, right? It's like shock to the system. Like this crazy event happens. They thought they were never, things were never going to change. They thought it was going to be the same. And then the f depending on how the four characters act, that's where you can relate. Like there is Sniff, one of the mice, who sometimes we may act like Sniff, who sniff is out the cha uh, sniffs out the change early. Scurry, uh, who acts... Or, or we may act like Scurry, who scurries, who scurries into action, or Ham, and this is unfortunately where I th would argue most of us are, Ham is um, who denies and resists the change as he fears that it will lead to something worse, and Haw, who learns to adapt to the, uh, in time when he sees that change can actually lead to something better, okay? So the key takeaways is, Fear that you let build up in your minds are far worse than the situation that actually exists. When you change what you believe, you change what you do. And getting out of your comfort zone makes adapting uh, to change easier and easier. 
Okay, so that, again, that was not a biblical reference, but let's look at this in the Bible. Uh, Exodus 16, if you would open your Bible at Exodus 16. You know, what I, what I realized in my life is that, you know, just like it was stated before, the fear of change really comes from the sense of uh, a lack of safety and security, right? So if I translate that to biblical terms, what I'm really afraid of or what the issue that I have, it's really what it boils down to is just a trust issue. Amen? And that's... That's kind of convicting in my life. And if you read the Bible with us, with the yearly, uh, the one-year plan that we're going through, we, we just, not that long ago, we all passed through the scriptures. And it's so easy to just fly through some of these scriptures. Uh, and I, I will tell you how I feel about it when, when, you know, when, I, when I fly through it. But read this in, in Exodus 16, uh, starting in verse 1. This is the Hebrews they're coming out of Egypt. Here's just a little background. Um, if you know the story, or you can, so I know it's sometimes hard for us to relate to the story, but I just want to paint this picture. Like, imagine you being there. Imagine you're one of those guys, and you just came out of Egypt, right? The largest kingdom or empire of the of that time, where you lived in miserable conditions as a slave in with the rulership in tyranny somebody ruling over you driving you to work as a slave and and then you just saw the mighty hand of god performing some crazy wild miracles and brought you out of that situation okay like just just think about that in your own mind like I don't even know if I want to go there, but like in today's culture, like you think like our government is bad and what's happening is bad. Well, multiply that by, I don't know, 100 or imagine like the person you were hoping to get elected this term is not going to get elected and then things get even worse and worse and worse. And then you're in that situation and then you see the mighty supernatural hand of God bringing you out of that situation. Okay, with miracles happening all around you. And now you're in the desert. And things are different now, right? And this is where you join in with the story in Exodus 16. And you're walking through the desert. And things are different how they used to be. And then it says, then the people, they set out from Elam. And all the congregation and the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Sin. Which is between Elam and Sinai. And on the 15th day... On the second month after the departure from the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we have died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full? For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger." Obviously, what you see is things are not going like they did back then. And the natural human reaction in my life is to start grumbling, right? I read, I was listening to a podcast by um, uh, John Maxwell, and he made this point, and it just really stuck with me that, you know, a crisis in life is a detour, and you know there's such thing in life that you can enjoy the detour tour. You know, detour is the tour, and, 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 and you can enjoy it. I remember uh, in a month season in my life, actually graduating from college, and I, again, let me just make a segue here. There's, I would say there's two very interesting seasons in life. Well, there's a lot more, but two that are very interesting to me, maybe because I haven't experienced all the other ones yet. But one is being a young adult. When you're a young adult, what I mean is like you graduated of high school, you're out of your, you're not a teenager anymore, and you're just figuring life out. And it's this season of change. Like you don't even know what you're going to do, who you're going to marry, where you're going to work, where you're going to live, and all these questions. It's just loaded with change. And the other one is what I'm experiencing right now is having toddlers at home. 
um, uh, or multiple babies. And things are like, when, just when you think you got a routine, things are changing uh, and not going the way that you thought that they should go. And you constantly have to adopt to change. Okay, um, now where was I going with this? Okay, yeah, I got it. So I remember this season of life, in my life, coming out of college, and I was just really worked up. Where am I, you know, I got a business diploma. Where am I going to work? Where am I going to live? What am I going to do? All those questions. And I remember the Lord was already talking to me about getting called into ministry and actually coming over here. Uh, long story short, uh, I know Pastor John... Uh, was already asking me that, you know, would I consider coming and working with the youth at this church? And I, I was like, I really don't want to work in ministry, but I really felt like that's what the Lord was calling me to do, blah, 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 blah. And we were actually on a boat trip with the youth kids uh, up north, uh, and we had a prayer night. And, and I remember I got this prophetic picture, and, and the picture was that there was someone who was on a path in the woods and he was walking on this path and and there was the top of the uh, mountain or hill or whatever that was the direction to go to but the path you know a path usually up there is never a straight path it's like zigzagging right and it's turning plus there's there's um woods all around you so sometimes you can't even see where you're going you just kind of you just trust the path and the process that it's, it's going up there. And I saw this person and was freaking out because the path would turn, you know, this way and then curve back. And it's like, oh, now it's going this way and it's not heading towards that direction. And this person was just troubled and freaking out. And, then I, and I shared it with the youth. And I actually remember Shiloh, I think it was at the time, who looked at me and said, Peter, that picture is for you. And it just hit me really on the heart that, wow, I'm like prophesying for myself. And... It, and that's exactly my point, that you can enjoy the detour tour. You know, that, again, what it boils down to is a trust issue. But if you trust God, you know, you can make the most out of a, out of a detour and actually uh, turn it for your benefit. Well, just like the story reads, well, let's see what happens to their detour. Then the Lord said to, this is verse uh, 4 uh, from chapter 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from the heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. On the sixth day, when they pre when they pre prepare, uh, on the sixth day when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, At evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumbling against the Lord, and what are we that you grumble against us? Obviously we know from their detour, one of the most awesome things happens just when you trust God is divine provision. Amen? You notice this, that everything you want or need in life is actually outside of your comfort zone. Their comfort zone was Egypt, right? Sitting next to the meat pots, and we're used to this. But think, if you really think about it, anything that you want or you need in life is outside of your comfort zone. Because if it's in your comfort zone, you would already have it. But since you don't, it has to be out of your comfort zone. And I really mean that, you know, where that's, let's say you want to be a missionary, and you're here, you know, you're living in the middle of Wisconsin, let's say. You know, being a missionary is outside of your comfort zone. It's on your heart, but it's out of your comfort zone. So you have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone. You know what I learned in my life, and I'm not very good at this, but I, um, I say this as the last word for this point. Whenever I encounter a need, now I was talking to my wife about this, what I try to say instead of voicing the need itself or the crisis, what I, what I try to voice is, Instead of stating the situation, I just say, well, that sounds like a new opportunity to trust God. Sounds like another opportunity just to trust God. And we can say that for everything. If the car breaks down, if whatever happens, if you get let go of your job, if the relationship that you were planning on if you didn't go the way that you planned, you can just say, well, this is another opportunity to just trust God. Amen? 
Okay, so then question number two for you. Are you resisting change in your life? How about with your walk in the Lord, with the Lord? What about, uh, are you resisting change in church? You know, I heard the story from a pastor. Let me just share this with you real quick. There was a pastor who was asked to take over a church uh, that was struggling, like big time. He said they had four people left in the congregation, and all four of them were ladies in their se uh, senior years. Okay? So this pastor is asked to take this church over, and he walks in there, and the first thing he said that he noticed, he says, I have never seen that many uh, fake flowers in my life. I mean, just the entire stage, basically, just fake flowers. So he walks in there, and guess what the first thing that he does uh, is? He, got, he gets rid of all the fake flowers. And then guess what happens? Three out of the four ladies, old ladies, leave the church. That, that was the final strike uh, for them. They, they're gone. You know which pastor was this? This was Brian Houston, and he says this was the start of Hillsong Church, Australia. Now, I know you can say, well, I don't agree with the mega church, whatever, and what Hillsong does today. I'm not going to get into that, but I will say you cannot deny the power of God through the worship ministry that swept through not just the nation of Australia, but the revival that came out of the Hillsong Church through Australia and around the world through worship in, in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, and that's how that church started. Uh, something changed, right? <laughs> Change could lead to something good. Amen? Uh, le let me give you a, just this biblical example here real quick. You know, uh, Joy will pull up hopefully some scriptures behind me. But as I was meditating on this, like look at this. This is from the life. Let's just look at the life of the apostle Peter and what he experienced in ministry when he thought, he had it all figured out. Like, first of all, you see how ministry started for the Apostle Peter uh, from Luke. This was in Luke 5 and 8. This is his first encounter with Jesus. And basically, he realizes that Jesus, this is the real deal. This is the Messiah. And he repents, but not just repents. He's like, dude, get away from me. Like, I'm a, I'm a sinner. Like, you know, like, we just... If in the holy presence of God, right? So this is how Peter starts out, uh, as we probably all did when we first repented. Uh, then from there, if you fast forward to Matthew 19, 28, uh, you know, they're walking with Jesus now for a season, and they're ministering with Jesus, and the ministry is going well, and, and things are going really well. And, and, and this is, Peter asked the question from Jesus, uh, well, we left everything behind here, Jesus. Like, what is our reward? You know, and, and Jesus says, well, you're going to be judging the 12 tribes of Israel with me. And then Jesus actually goes on in the story saying that, not just that, and in this world, you will get everything multiplied back. You know, concept, seek the kingdom of God first, and everything else will be added unto you. And I can just see, if I was, you know, part of the disciple group there, I was like, yeah. I can get on board with this. Like, this is, this is great. Like, my reward is, is, is awesome, right? And, now, and then you see the disciples in uh, Luke 9, 4, uh, 46. They actually start arguing now amongst themselves, saying, who's the greatest? Like, you know, like, who's going to sit on your left and who's going to sit on your right? I mean, come on, we got to establish some sort of an order here, right? And then, and then uh, Jesus tells them, you guys are missing the point. Um, then, if you fast forward a little, uh, even a little more, in John 14, 22, uh, this is now, basically, you know, today is Palm Sunday, right? Like, the Messiah, as, as, especially according to their interpretation of the Scripture, it's like, he's, coming, he's, he's here, he's coming in, and we got the, we know the story. Like, we know how this is going to go down. He's going to overthrow this government, the Romans, and the chief priests and all the Pharisees, and he's going to sit in the throne, and we're going to sit right next to him. And I can especially get on board with that. And then you see, um, and Jesus is actually breaking the news uh, down to them, like, hey, guys, this is going to go a little differently here, how the, I, the ministry I planned for your life is supposed to go. 
then they actually start questioning him, like, how is, how is that that you're not going to reveal yourself to the whole world, but just to us? Like, what is this nonsense, Jesus, right? So things are already changing. Uh, and then from there, Matthew 26, 57, we know, you know Jesus is taken away, is being crucified, and all of those guys flee like cowards, like, skip this, like, you know, I'm, I'm out, uh, Quite a big shift from where we were just a couple of scriptures ago. And then from there, we know the story that Jesus tells them, don't leave now that he's risen until you fill with power with the Holy Spirit. Again, a little change in their ministry. They probably they didn't even know much about the Holy Spirit at this point. But then we see Jesus coming and breathing on them, and they're being baptized on, uh, in the Holy Spirit. And then we all know Book of Acts 2, 14 now the cowards who fled before, now that Peter and John and those guys are just boldly preaching the word of God uh, and people are being saved. They're being arrested for it and they don't care. Like, like they know that this is, this is the truth. They're filled with the power. They're being led by the spirit. Okay, now, let, now catch this. Then book of Acts 2.47, what you see there is that now the church is growing. And I can just totally relate to them right now at this point, saying, like, we figured it out, right? The church is growing. This is good. People are coming. People are being saved. We're doing the work of the ministry. People are being baptized. And this is awesome. This is the church of Jerusalem. This is the largest church. Uh, and if you're a true believer, you're going to come to this church. Amen? And guess what happens next? Uh, a little detour. Um, Book of Acts 8.1, Stephen gets stoned to death, and it says a great persecution breaks out against the church. We know the story. Jesus told them, go into all the world. Yet, they were like, they changed the message a little bit. Well, yes, we like this Holy Spirit stuff. We like to be at this one place. This is good for us to be here, amen? And then persecution breaks out, and whether they want or not, they have to start scattering now. And now the gospel, not the way they planned it, a lot of change in ministry, but now the gospel is spreading, actually, like wildflower. Amen? And then I'll take it even a step further. And the book of Acts 11:18 is the story of Peter going to the centurion uh, and because he has a vision. And they get, the, the Gentiles start getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And that just really blows the religious socks off of all of them. These guys who are raised, you know, Jews uh, who were next to Jesus, they actually question, if you look at the scripture reference before, if you read that chapter, they called Peter aside and they were like, what are you doing? How dare you going to the unclean people and fellowshipping with them? And... And then he says, no, guys, like, I, was, I wasn't even, I was just sharing the gospel message, and the Holy Spirit filled them. Like, I didn't even lay hands on them. Quite a change in ministry. And then they're all in awe, and they started glorifying God and realizing there's a change in ministry. And they start adapting. Obviously, Paul comes along, who specifically then starts his own ministry, going to the, going to the Gentiles specifically. And again, the gospel starts spreading like crazy. John Maxwell said, one of the major keys to success is to keep moving forward on the journey, making the best out of detours and interruptions, turning adversity into advantage. Amen? You know, so I think of that, how many times the apostles probably thought, we know how to run church, we figured it out. And then how many times did, was it a little surprise? Now, let me ask us the question as church or myself. How often do we think, oh, we figured out how to run church? Like, this is how, this is what we do. This is how it is. This is, this is good. And again, I'm not against structure. I'm actually all for structure and planning. I'm really speaking to myself. But then let me just say this. We have this vision for the valley, okay, that Pastor John talks about, planting churches and the prophecies that, that I, I do agree with because they're absolutely biblical prophecies that people will come to the Lord and there's going to be changes in their life. Uh, they will get set free. There's going to be deliverances. The people are there's going to be financial breakthrough in people's lives. 
Um, people are going to be getting baptized. And it says that whole cities will come back before Jesus returns to, to a godly living, uh, follow, uh, to a biblical living. Amen? Then if I think of that, you know what the next question that comes to my head is, is how is that going to look like? Well, I don't know the answer, sorry. But I will tell you this, it will look totally different than what it looks right now. It will be a lot of change, and it will not. What you see right now, it's not going to look like this, I can guarantee you. So I think we all better get ready for change. Amen? The quicker you start embracing change, the better off you will be. And here's my last point. How quick or slow are you to adapt to change? And that's really... That's, that's a really heavy question if you think about that. How quick or slow are you to adapt to change? I heard another story. I probably said this before, but I really like it, so I'll share it again. This was a pastor uh, who took over a church, and he said that at this church, the pulpit was like on the right side of the, ch- of the stage. And um, he took this, they, the, the senior pastor, uh, I think, retired, and so this, this pastor was asked to take over. I think this is some sort of a relig- more religious church. Um, and he walks in there the first Sunday, and, and that's when he notices that the pulpit is here to the right side. And he says he has never preached. He likes to preach from the middle. So he goes and grabs the pulpit and puts it in the middle of the stage. And then, you know, it's still 15 minutes till service starts. So he starts talking to some people, mingling, and then looks back, and he sees that the pulpit moved back. (laughs) It's like, oh, you know, maybe somebody just grabbed it, whatever. He goes up there, he grabs it, he moves it back. It's still five minutes to church starts. He starts talking to people. It's time to start the church. He turns, and the pulpit is back where it came from. And then he realizes, "I I, I, I know what's going on. And then he said he spent the next two months preaching every Sunday, just moving it an inch. And he says in two months, he arrived to the middle of the stage and nobody moved the pulpit back anymore. <laughs> but see, it's, it's just an eye-opening story of, you know, how people struggle with change, especially in church. <laughs> Amen? I shared this story, and, and this is actually the one that I, I used to meditate a lot on. Um, you know the story of the Jews in Eastern Europe? That um, when and we just played the trailer and, and they were talking about similar points. And actually, the movie is about makes some similar points to this that is very eye opening. Um, but basically, when the Jews, why so many Jews died, uh, especially, here's a fun fact for you I give this to you for free. In Auschwitz, the most, uh, the highest nationality of Jews who died were Hungarians. Uh, and there's a couple reasons for that, but the main reason was that Hungary didn't let their Jews, didn't give out their Jews the longest. Like, he, they held on to the Jews the longest, like, protected them. But then it got to the point in the war where Hitler was like, no, that's it. Like, slap on your hand, put the Jews on the trains. Um, and by that time, it was so late in the war that all those trains went straight to Auschwitz. They didn't go to the war camps anymore. That was towards the end of the war. Um, so they all went to Auschwitz, so the highest nationality is Hungarian Jews, uh, who, in Auschwitz specifically, who passed away there. And I, I, I think of this often that, again, did you know that, you know why so many Jews died? is because they were slow to adapt to change. And I say that because if you look at history, like, there's a lot of Jews who realized what was going on early on, and they said, you know what, I'm not going to wait this out here. And they got on a boat, and they went to America, and they became, some, lots of those became very successful uh, people today, and, and their heritage that they passed on to their children. But those who said, no, it surely will not get that bad, right? It surely, oh, Hitler will not do that. Actually, that's also why the death camp works so well, because to the last point, they made them believe that they're going to work, they're not going to the death, death camps. But those who were the slowest to realize that there is a change in government and there's a change that things are going, uh, who were the slowest, unfortunately, they're the ones who died out. 
and it's it's very sad, but it's a cautionary lesson for me. You know how slow am I to adapt to changes in my life? I'll give you a business example. Uh, for young people, you guys have no idea what this word is that I'm about to say. But how many of you heard the word Nokia, the t cell phone Nokia? Like Nokia. When I was growing up in middle school, I mean, a Nokia cell phone was undestroyed. I mean, that was like the only cell phone to go with. I mean, there were other co competitors, but Nokia was just amazing. They made cell phones that you could throw out of a 10-story building and it hit the ground, and, and it, w you know, it would still work. The battery lasted two weeks when it was on and you were using it. And remember when early 2000s, I think, when Steve Jobs came on the scene and he brought the iPhone, obviously, but the thing with iPhone was it was, it was touchscreen. And not that Nokia didn't have the technology. Um, they just thought, oh, this new thing, like, this is never going to catch on. You know what a uh, phone like that is good for? It's, it's for you to protect it all the time because you're going to scratch the screen with your nails. You're going to drop it. It's going to break. And Nokia, did not, although they came out with a couple of touchscreen phones, but they thought, this is not going anywhere. Nokia doesn't even exist today anymore. You know, iPhone took over, and I think Samsung was like the first one who actually realized, like, there's some change happening in the phone industry, and we better start copying what iPhone is doing. And that's how the first Samsung started converting. And now, you know, Samsung is alive and well today, but Nokia, I don't even think it exists as a cell phone company, really. Uh, so again, how quick are you to adapt to change? I will wrap it up. You know, I will say this too for us. Now here's a biblical example. Guess who were the people in the Bible who resisted change the longest? That's a group of people called the Pharisees. They were the ones who were just like, no, we like the way things are. We like the traditions. We like, we figured this out. We figured out, we like the law. It's pretty clear. This Jesus guy, nah. So my you know, question to us today as a church, if we are not reaching the people, we ought to change the method, maybe. I'm not saying change the message. Don't ever compromise on the message. But should we change the method? And again, it's interesting to me that out of all the organizations that are existing or word, I would argue that the church is the one usually that's slowest to change. You know, in COVID, when COVID 20, uh, 20 well, when, in 2020, when like COVID kicked in, uh, that was like ch a wake up call for a lot of churches. But you know, I, I remember one of the thing, one of the reasons we actually grew as a church is because uh, we did something different. We didn't do what the government was telling us to do. We did what we felt like the Holy Spirit was telling us to do, and that was different. And, and I, I believe that was one of the reasons we, we really grew, grew during COVID. Um, and praise God for the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'll end with these two scriptures. John 3, 8. Jesus says, here, let me turn there. John 3, 8, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, and he's painting a picture for us, I think, per specifically for us, and he's, I think he's talking to a Pharisee, Nicodemus, yeah, which is, again, interesting, somebody, a Pharisee, who is probably slow to change, but of all the Pharisees, Nicodemus was the good guy, right, who was actually like, no, there's something with the Jesus guy. And he's asking Jesus about this, you know, spirit and being born again and all that. And then Jesus makes this statement about the Holy Spirit. Uh, John 3, 8, it says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes, and, uh, where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. I just thought it's interesting that the, you know, the this picture that Jesus is painting for us about the Holy Spirit so that we could kind of understand it a little bit with our earthly mind is it's like the wind. 
It's not saying the Holy Spirit is the wind, but it's like the wind. And if you think about in an earthly analogy, the wind, what is the wind? I can't see it, but I feel the change, right? I feel the air moving through my hair or, or my face. I, feel, I see the trees moving or, or something. I just see the impact and the change. And that's how Jesus describes the Spirit. And again, I'll just point back to what I said earlier. Jesus in his ministry never really did the same thing. He always was in tune with the Holy Spirit. How much more should we be if we want to be successful in ministry? Last scripture, Isaiah 43, 19 says, Behold, I will do something new. Everybody say something new. Something new means change. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness rivers in the desert father god i just thank you so much uh, that your holy spirit is here that you didn't call us to do this the work of the ministry on our own but you call you said that the holy spirit will come and lead us and guide us and bring to our remembrance everything you said and 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 we will be filled with the holy spirit and 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 operate with and through your Holy Spirit. Lord, I just pray that we will be a church that moves with your Spirit, that we are quick to move with your Spirit, that we're quick to adapt, to change, and we're quick to hear the voice of the Spirit and, and do what you say, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.